Hello and a warm welcome to the Business Day Dialogues Live in partnership with the SA Tide program. Now we're delighted to host you in what promises to be an insightful and informative session, highlighting the collaborative efforts in formulating inclusive economic development policies. Now today's program is pre-recorded. It's a discussion that we certainly ask you to participate in by welcoming your feedback and interaction. Today, we'll also be hearing from key speakers who will assist us in providing more clarity on today's initiative. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Inoko Kotongwana, Wibuso Mudise of National Treasury, and Kunal Sen of UniWIDA. Now, as our viewers, you are more than welcome to share your questions under the live chat, and a representative from SA Tide will be available on the live chat to respond to these questions on behalf of our speakers today. Now ask yourself, what's needed to transform South Africa's economy? South Africa certainly needs bold action to turn its economic fortunes around. Such action must be founded on credible evidence-based research. Under the Southern Africa Towards Inclusive Economic Development, or SA Tide program, a team of local and international researchers collaborated with key departments within the economic cluster of the South African gov government. Now, together, they work to address the region's major development challenges. This discussion will focus on the SA Tide's diverse work and unpack insights to further bridge the gap between research and policymaking. This online event will also mark the launch of the SA Tide Report, a platform for evidence-based policy formulation, lessons from SA Tide. Now, this report showcases the entirety of research produced under the SA Tide program during phase one and will be made available to you after today's session. The Southern Africa Towards Inclusive Economic Development SA Tide program provides a platform for researchers and policymakers to work together in addressing today's major development challenges. Please welcome our first speaker for today, Wibuso Mudise. Acting Deputy Director General of the Economic Policy Division, National Treasury, who will present the opening remarks for today's conversation. Wibuso Mudise is the Acting Deputy Director General of the Economic Policy Division at the National Treasury. She's also a co-leader for the Macroeconomic Modeling uh, for Policy Formulation, a work stream of SA Tide. Ladies and gentlemen, please warmly welcome Wibuso Mudise. Thank you, Kuku. Good morning, Minister Kotongwane, and to our viewers, good morning, and thank you for joining us for this event. The Southern Africa Towards Inclusive Economic Development, or SA Tide program, is a partnership between the United Nations University World Institute for Development Economic Research, or UNU WIDA, the National Treasury, and the International Food Policy Research Institute, or IFPRI. This, along with South the South African Revenue Service, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, the Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, and Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies. The program has provided a platform for researchers and policymakers to work together to address today's major development challenges. This has been achieved across the six programs thematic work streams, namely, one, enterprise development for job creation and growth, two, public revenue mobilization for inclusive development, three, macroeconomic modeling for policy formulation, four, turning the tide on inequality, five, climate change and energy transition as drivers for change, and six, regional growth for Southern Africa's prosperity. Through powerful innovations, both in data through the Data Lab and partnerships with leading international and domestic researchers, the program has produced more than 175 research studies, which have been published over three and a half years and has built lasting technical capabilities in the South African public service. In addition, the program has contributed significantly to building capacity in economic analysis and evidence-based policymaking. Through the program, 11 PhD scholarships were awarded to public servants, while more than 50 students participated in the Young Scholars Program. This program exposed master's students to the work environment while producing high quality and relevant research. We also worked with several research assistants who supported the work of the program. 
This has only been possible because the program is built on deep engagement between researchers and public institutions and because of the commitment of its partners to, the, to work together to improve the interface between research and policy making. I would like to take this opportunity to extend our gratitude and appreciation to the SA Tide Advisory Board, our program partners, sister departments and institutions, along with the European Union delegation who have funded supported and advocated for the success of the program. I would also like to extend my thanks and appreciation to the extensive networks of researchers, civil servants and administrators who have contributed to the program for their effort and commitment to make SA Tide the success that it is. I have no doubt that the networks and effective partnerships built through the program will continue to strengthen evidence-based policy formulation in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you to Buibuso for your opening remarks and the introduction to the SA Tide program. Very critical that we now going to engage in a conversation as we welcome the Minister of Finance, Minister Inok Kodongwana, who will assist us in expanding on the six work streams that were highlighted by Buibuso in her welcome introduction and, of course, offer some insight as to how this research may continue to assist the National Treasury of South Africa to implement policies and, of course, uh, derive the necessary out outcomes to attain and achieve inclusive economic growth. Mr. Inok Kodongwana was appointed as Minister of Finance of the Republic of South Africa on the 5th of August 2021. He holds an MSc degree in Financial Economics from the University of London and is a member of the National Executive Committee of the African National Congress, the ANC, since 1997. He is the current chairperson of the ANC's Economic Transformation Subcommittee. Honourable Minister, good to have you with us today. A uh, few tough questions that we might ask you, but I promise it won't be all too difficult, but really just a reflection of uh, the collaborative efforts that we see regarding SA Tide. Thank, thank you again for your time, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed. Well, as mentioned, uh, we will be reflecting on the six work streams to further provide some clarity on the importance, the role and the function of the research and collaborative efforts that have been attained to share some insight with us as to how best inclusive economic development can be prioritized. Let's start off with the first video to give us some clarity on the importance of data. The Tax Data Lab is a secure state-of-the-art facility located at the National Treasury. South Africa is the first African country to make its tax data available to academics and policymakers for research purposes through the SA Tide program. So this is the National Treasury Secure Data Facility and this is where we house all the tax data as well as a few other data sets. We've currently got procurement data as well. There's eight terminals and they're all connected to a server. So basically researchers come in and prior to coming in, they've signed a secrecy agreement as well as a non-disclosure agreement. We've put all these controls in place to maintain the integrity of the data. This is the server which we ultimately control all the data analysis through and uh, the server is not connected to the internet. So essentially this, this is an island. There is no other means to access it but through our profiles and the profiles we set up for researchers. We get data sets from SARS in raw form and our job is then to clean the data and transform it so it can be used by researchers. The great thing about this data is that it's longitudinal, which means that you can track the same individual across time, which really allows us to look at some of the employment dynamics. And it's provided invaluable insights. I think how this particular data set is putting a complete and a supplementary and almost a 360 view is that we provide anonymized data across all tax products that SARS administers. So you've got a full data set of the individuals that are registered with SARS, and then we collect information on corporates, we collect information on vet vendors, we collect information on employers, we collect information on traders. So you almost have like a 360 view of what's happening in the economy and it's all coming from one institution. Then if you take this data and you overlay it with, let's say, somebody in the trade environment, you are able to pull out the necessary data points that supplements and complements what the trade agenda is for South Africa. When you are working without 
the facility of these tax administrative data, you often have to work at a much higher level of generality. Sure, we know that some enterprises are shifting profits. Some companies might be adjusting their behavior uh, when taxes are changing. But there is a great difference between being able to say exactly which categories of enterprising are doing what. So for example, it allowed us to look at uh, or to analyze the economy at the level of the firm rather than at the level of the sector. And that gives us much more nuanced and detailed insights. It also provides us a much greater sense of the formal workforce, which gives us insight into the labor market that we did not have before. And then of course, there's quite a lot of detail available in the tax administrative data and linking different data sets allows one to approach policy questions from new angles and new perspectives. Some refreshing perspective that was provided there, Minister, and really helping us, I guess, dig deeper into understanding one of the first work streams mm -hmm. of SA Tide and the importance of research there. And perhaps you can help us understand and provide further clarity on what the benefit is of a tax database when it comes to policy formulation. For policymakers, the tax data allows us to evaluate policy design and the long run effects of social programs and tax incentive, for instance, such as the tech employment tax incentive. It also provides insights into how to make changes to these programs informed by improved quality and the breadth of evidence. The tax database has also garnered interest from researchers around the world, and some have partnered with the public servant, which has been a critical for capacity building and ensures that research fits into policy debates. Policy choices informed by quality research can make a major difference in moving forward policy implementation. That's the significance of this. Mm -hmm. Workstream 1 focuses on firm performance and how they adapt to incentives and regulation. And I suppose in the context of South Africa's poor economic environment, low growth, high levels of unemployment, it looks at how certain policy interventions, whether it be some tax policy, labor market interventions, industrial policy, and whether those policies are actually working towards creating employment and growth and investment. And in, in terms of the recommendations that have come out, we can figure out where these policy interventions are lacking and where we need to design them better, and also new policy interventions that are required. I think one of the, the big findings from the research relates to globalization and the fragmentation of production networks. And, and really what we see in South Africa is it has led to a substitution of intermediate inputs produced onshore with inputs. So what this has really led to is an early deindustrialization process. And one of the key findings from this kind of body of research is that especially the Chinese import penetration has been found to be highly negatively associated with employment growth, with sales growth, with firm survival rates, any of the metrics that we would be interested in. But on the plus side, on the positive side, investing in innovation and building capabilities can offset that negative impact of the Chinese import competition. So what we need is complementary policy measures that go alongside the actual furtherance of R&D investments. That can be done in numerous ways, but what we need is a consolidated, broader industry uh, policy that makes sure that we take into account the externalities of a given policy on different sectors. There is significant what we call misallocation of capital in uh, South Africa, some uh, parts of the research also showed this. And here the policy recommendation is much more clear. We need a stronger focus on reallocating capital to more medium sized smaller firms and away from dominating firms, for example, in mining and, and, and utilities. The largest 10% of firms, they account for 98% of the estimated tax loss in South Africa. So the bigger firms, are basically the best at avoiding taxes that should go to the benefit of the majority of the population. 
and this needs to be fixed. We need what we call an easy build system that flags firms that diverge from the so-called arm's length pricing principle in taxation. And we have seen other countries around the globe being successful in pursuing that strategy. South Africa could gain from this and avoid tax avoidance by the larger firms. Minister, this takes us back to a conversation regarding the focus on small and medium enterprises and, of course, trying to ensure that they are supported in order to derive productivity and see them succeed in the long term. Help us understand what measures can be put in place, given the outcomes we see from SA Tide, to help facilitate the success of small and medium businesses in South Africa. Building a dynamic and resilient enterprise sector is critical for to address low economic growth and structural unemployment, particularly among young people. SMMEs are a critical part of this. This is because they generate employment, adapt to more flexibility to the changing economic environment and channel link funds back into local communities. But we know that they will only fulfill this potential in an environment which minimizes their growth, growth constraint and increases their chances of success. The research allows us to better understand these challenges and supports more informed policy design. All in all, there's no silver bullet to facilitate a robust and resilient economy. It is important that the various interventions are coordinated certainly needed. So I guess some reprieve for small business owners in terms of a reduction of the red tape they're often are con concerned about. There's that discussion now in, the, in, in Operation Vulindela, which looks at the reduction of red tape to ensure that the small and medium enterprises, uh, there's lesser regulation on them. They can be allowed space to, to grow. Yeah. Or coordinated efforts nonetheless. Yeah. One of the items that is critical for the economic growth in Southern Africa is looking at public resource mobilization in the world of taxation. And the idea is to say that if countries are able to collect revenue and use that revenue for its own development and use that revenue in a targeted way towards inclusive growth and inclusive development, that that would assist in us at, um, achieving the objectives and the aims that SA Tide program is working towards. For example, there was a study that looked at trade mispricing as a way um, of perhaps seeing a lot of the large corporates moving money out of, out of countries and making use of base erosion and profit shifting mechanisms. Other areas would be more traditional ways of looking at tax gap. Particularly, there was a study that was done in the non-financial sector where we looked at national accounts data, but then we sort of took it from the top down and meshed it with our anonymized tax data to see where are the areas that cause this tax gap. It allows for policy discussions, it allows for tax design discussions, allows for multifaceted areas that talks to a topic that is old, but the data allows us to then start looking at interesting new paradigms. So key to um, economic growth is productivity growth. And the way the South African system currently handles corporate income taxation doesn't necessarily promote productivity growth. So it gives lower effective tax burden to some of the older industries, if you wish, and not necessarily so, so many tax incentives for research development and the newer service sectors. So that's one. Then maybe a second one could be that the correct mix of using tax instruments versus social grants for redistribution. So I think it would be more useful to have these direct benefits rather than zero rating in the value added tax system in order to reach the um, uh, distributional objectives.
Minister, if we do take a look at that video, and of course understanding Workstream 2, the importance of taxes does come to the fore, uh, given the uh, impact it can have on society. Mm -hmm. I'm keen to understand from your perspective, as a representative of government, what you make of some of the insight and the research that we understand regarding uh, tax research and what might have stood out for you, and most importantly, how you might believe that some of these themes might be able to fit into our current tax policy in the, in the country. Uh, well, the main role of tax policy is to raise revenue. We are continually striving to ensure that the overall tax policy system is built on essential design principles such as efficiency, fairness and simplicity. All emphasized in, 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 in the research findings. We have learned from the research that taxes can distort decisions made by people and business. Mm. This is something we are actually aware of and are learning from these insights to improve policy making in this regard. So we certainly need to uh, uh, looking forward to some of those benefits and of course I guess an ongoing collaborative effort balancing the incentives and of course the needs that government does need in terms of revenue. Correctly so. Yeah. Macroeconomic policy is about how you manage shocks and how you manage fluctuations. But macroeconomic policy, of course, also interplays with the longer term. In a way, it influences which direction you go. But at the same time, the actual conditions, they, they impose certain constraints on what you can do with policy. Where is it the National Treasury on the fiscal policy side uh, can influence? And where is it on the monetary policy side that the South African Reserve Bank can actually help uh, promote the structural transformation of the economy and the stability of the economy. Obviously, this has been very much uh, reflected in the responses to the uh, COVID crisis, where it's pretty clear that there were some major responses taken for good reasons, but uh, you also needed to have a, a, an acute sense of the fiscal space available and what would be the implications of what you were doing in order to take the right decisions. We've also looked at how different sectors within the non-financial part of the economy react to changes. Because for fiscal policy to have an effect, it must work through its impact upon industry one, which changes its demand for the outputs of industry two, and so on and so on. And we've used a technique based upon social accounting matrices. We did that for estimating the effects of the first lockdown to calculate the impact of the lockdown upon economic activity in South Africa. And our calculations proved to be accurate. And they informed the emergency budget that uh, the minister and government brought in uh, at the time of lockdown. So the work we did on the multiplier from that disaggregated point of view proved the worth of, of doing that kind of thing. The main areas of work focused around fiscal and monetary policy. And in the fiscal policy space, there was a big focus around fiscal multipliers. The reason why fiscal multipliers are important is because it tells you about the relationship between government spending as well as government taxation and economic growth. And any fiscal policy choice you make has to be informed by a very rigorous understanding of how fiscal multipliers are changing over time. And so there was quite a lot of work in this area that ultimately influenced and informed how the National Treasury crafted its own macro fiscal stance. Minister, I think quite refreshing for us to hear there how the uh, tools and models around macroeconomic uh, uh, policy and modeling component have uh, played a role, especially in hindsight if we reflect on the pandemic. But help us understand how this continues to uh, play an influence on policy formulation. It's clear that historical low levels of growth in the domestic economy, reflecting several structural challenges, are inadequate to address our developmental challenges. Macroeconomic policy alone cannot address these poor long-term growth trends. However, efficient fiscal and monetary policy plays a critical role in addressing the high levels of income inequality. In the light of this, gaining insights into the impacts of macroeconomic policy choices 
on economic outcomes is essential and the research help us to do this. We need to think about what is going to include South Africans in our economic development. And so some of the main areas of work are just measuring our inequality in very textured ways, understanding it very deeply. And so, for example, we've worked with the, the tax data that this policy has made available because it gives you a lens into who benefits and who doesn't benefit from our economic growth. We've learned that the wage distribution in South Africa is alarmingly unequal. So if you're talking about the spread of benefits from all the activities that we do in the economy, it's not really working in a way that's inclusive. We've been able to use the tax data to evaluate some of government's policy interventions. So the employment tax incentive is an incentive that's designed to lower the price of labor and hopefully encourage firms to hire young workers. And we found out that it's hard just lowering the wages in an environment in which economic activity depends on many, many things. And so in a sense, it's quite a daunting lesson. The other work then has, has focused on households themselves and how they survive and understanding their livelihoods very, very well. And so it's painted a picture of snakes and ladders in which it's been tough going over the last five years for South Africans, even South Africans in the so-called middle class. What I've seen from the work that I've done and observing how people move between employment, I saw that people change employment quite rapidly. And I wanted to see whether transport is a reason, part of the reason why people um, churn so much their employment. And then this opportunity of SITI came about where we could access the South African Revenue Services database that provides us with information on where people live and where people work, as well as their employment duration. We've seen that predominantly individuals that have traveled to work, if they used train or rail to get to work, they now travel 107 minutes one way per day to get to employment. That's almost two hours one way. Bus commuters now travel 14 minutes longer on average. Minibus taxi users now travel 13 minutes more. People are captive to our public transport. And what we've seen is that because of the high cost of transport, that results in individuals starting to say, well, is it worthwhile for me to actually travel to employment? And we've seen specifically within the low to medium income households or individuals in that labor market churning quite rapidly. Some stark facts and uh, figures that we have to absorb there that, uh, again, underscore the reality of inequality in South Africa, Minister. Mm -hmm. uh, and this also speaks to uh, the uh, vast and extensive social security program that we're well aware of mm -hmm. that South Africa has. Help us unpack how the SATI program perhaps has shared some evidence-based program evaluation that can assist with South Africa's approach to policy uh, making with this regard to uh, social security specifically. The, the advent of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic certainly put South Africa's uh, stance of social security to the test. However, state-led efforts have largely staved off the worst economic impacts of the pandemic through emergency interventions that relied both on the solid backbone of the existing social assistant as well as new interventions. The research done in this area has provided key insights on the extent of South Africa's poverty and inequality. This work can inform both short-term interventions to tackle South Africa's triple economic challenges of poverty, inequality and unemployment. It's a long road. We need everyone's buy-in for sure for that one. No, we need some. Hence the president calls for a social compact. Mm -hmm. SA Tide has played a big role in shifting the perceptions in 
South Africa in government, in business, and in society in general about you know what what are the costs and benefits of a renewable energy future. And uh, you know our analysis shows that uh, you can move to a very very substantial share of renewables at essentially zero cost or or even employment and growth benefits. And that's a very very big shift from what was the case uh, so many years ago. Uh, that was driven by technical advance in wind generation, solar generation, and in what's called systems integration, how we get supply to meet demand. Many of the conclusions from the long-term adaptation strategies are, are essentially holding, but we're looking at uh, what are the implications for growth? What are the implications for fiscus? And a lot of what we're doing uh, involves the kinds of uncertainties that climate change generates. We don't know exactly what the climate future will look like. And so coming up with relatively robust responses to climate change is really quite important. So one of the things that we've highlighted and continue to highlight is South Africa has a very advanced water infrastructure. And that uh, water infrastructure is extremely important in the context of climate change when we're expecting uh, more extreme events, higher heat, uh, more severe droughts. And the ability to shift water around is a remarkable stabilizer. And so that infrastructure is really quite important. One of the key things we sort of did was that we enhanced the energy economic model, which is very useful for energy policy and mitigation policy analysis. So this is really a tool that can be used beyond the SA Thai project. We looked at the role of renewable energy in South Africa within the energy system. The key findings from the work that we did was that solar PV and wind play a key role in power generation for South Africa in the future. And if we think about it, the power sector is really one of the largest single emitters in the country. So if we're serious about reducing emissions, it's really a sector that we do need to tackle. One of the advantages of having cleaner power is that it allows for other sectors also to start taking up cleaner technology options. We shift gears to Workstream 5, Minister, and this really does place a theme that is uh, no doubt on the global agenda that South Africa itself too uh, is committed to. Uh, help us unpack and understand how fast-tracking the decarbonization of the economy can really assist in attaining and achieving a just transition. South Africa remains the world's 12th largest emitter and has set ambition targets in its latest national determined contribution. The Paris Agreement. SA Tide helps us unpack the impact of climate change on, on the economy to build a more resilient economy and weigh the cost and benefits of decarbonizing the economy. This critical research provides the evidence needed to determine the pace and scale of this trans just transition project for the country. Several of the most important policy recommendations have to do with deepening the process of regional integration in Southern Africa. In particular, we've uh, explored a series of themes that have to do with trying to understand the role of special economic zones, of other kinds of industrial zones in actually enhancing the ability of many African countries to exchange with, with South Africa and to benefit from the trading relationship with, with South Africa. In fact, we've worked quite closely with the Trade and Industrial Policy uh, Strategies Group to try to tease out some of the policy findings that we have from these sorts of efforts to understand the role of special zones and industrial development zones in economic development uh, across the region. We've also explored, I think, in a rather meaningful way, the potential of Southern Africa to develop along lines that are somewhat less traditional than the existing trading relationships. I mean, the, the sort of conventional wisdom is that South Africa exports manufactured goods and primarily benefits from that relationship to the exclusion of industrial development in other countries. We sponsored some, I think, fairly innovative and, and pioneering research in terms of looking at, let's say, the relationship between urbanization and growth in the region, the relationship between the development of agricultural exports and the ability 
agricultural exporters to actually benefit from the trade relationship with South Africa. And the presence of value chains, I think, has been quite an important exercise for us to try to understand the significance of regional value chains in these trading relations. A very key theme, Minister, that does speak to the uh, overall uh, uh, focus to really in assist in facilitating trade across uh, the uh, African continent. And South Africa has often been regarded as a big brother, right, when it comes to a few of its neighboring countries. But how can we play a more effective role as being a key economic participant and player within the region? The integration of markets in Africa is central to enhancing economic development, not only of South Africa but of the continent as a whole. And trade. Trade is central to economic growth of all of us. There's potential for South Africa to become an engine for intra-regional trade and industrial development by linking other Southern African countries to our global value chain. They themselves in that process generate growth in their own, own economy. Uh, it should, it's not a one-way process. The research under this work stream identify products in which Southern Africa and countries are competitive, leading to successful creation of a regional value chain. This is crucial in light of the opportunities presented by the African continental free trade area. Mm -hmm. Well, that's quite refreshing to hear, Minister, because we're well aware that that does have further ripple effects, especially uh, on the value chain, the development of entrepreneurs, new sectors that can also come on board, uh, and really seeing uh, inclusive economic development, not just for South Africa alone, but for the region uh, and even the greater continent. The questions are going to be capacities we're going to develop in South Africa to be able to uh, participate in this important uh, trade development. Yeah, certainly. Honourable Minister, it's really been a pleasure engaging with you and uh, receiving some of your insight on the research, the various workflows, and how they speak to some of the policies that uh, potentially could be implemented in South Africa. So I, I guess we leave it on a confident note that these are being considered uh, and, of course, will potentially uh, be considered as well when it comes to policy formation in the country. Thank you very much. We, like the team, we are waiting for interesting feedback as uh, on the research streams Indeed. and work streams. Thank you so much. Thank you. A big thank you to the uh, Honorable Minister of Finance of the Republic of South Africa, Minister Enoch Kodongwana. Well, we shift gears now for a moment to seek further clarity, not only on these work streams, but of course the outcomes of phase one of the research that has been facilitated and participated in through SA Tide, and also looking forward to the future phase two specifically. To help us unpack more on this, please welcome Kunal Sen. He's the director of UniWider, who will be presenting the look to the future. Professor Kunal Sen has over three decades of experience in academic and applied development economics research. He's the author of eight books and the editor of five volumes on the economics and political economy of development. From 2019, he is the director of UniWider and is a professor of development economics at the Global Development Institute, University of Manchester. Please warmly welcome Kunal Sen. SATI brings together world-class researchers with policymakers to combat poverty and inclusiveness related challenges in South Africa. A big part of what SATI does is related to try to engage the policymaking community as a partner. This is what is distinctive about this program and makes it rather unique to ensure impact on policies promoting economic transformation and curbing inequality. SATI builds on best practices on policy research and engages the key use of the research, policymakers and technical staff in government departments into all aspects of the program. Hence, a key aspect of the program is to encourage networking and discussion among people involved in policy processes and civil society, aiming to bridge the gap between research and policy making. Leading experts in UniWider have been guiding the progress of research jointly with key staff from the South African government institutions, in particular the National Treasury, to co-create and co-implement research, capacity development and policy bridging initiatives. UniWider is excited to continue this engagement alongside our South African partners with SATI moving into second phase in 2022. 
The next phase is the time to carry forward the key principles that have already proven themselves successful. A strong emphasis will still be put on collaboration and inclusivity across the entire operation. The three programmatic pillars, research, capacity development, and policy bridging will continue to be at the center and the commitment to create a world-class research infrastructure around South African administrative tax data will remain. The next phase will explore new research ideas, collaborations, and activities that can result in even larger impact on the ground in both the short run and the long run. Some new areas and emphasis of SA tight phase two include an increased investment in building data infrastructure for policy relevant research around enterprise development, public revenue mobilization, and inequality. Countries need data and evidence to create, amend, and evaluate policy. South Africa has been at the vanguard of data collection in Sub-Saharan Africa, with long, strong and long-standing institutions collecting data for research purposes. Making task and micro microdata available for research purposes places South Africa at the forefront of big data research for development and puts the country in a novel position relative to other developing and emerging economies. The COVID-19 pandemic erupted when South Africa was already in a weak economic and physical position. South Africa was already in a technical recession at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in, South Africa, in the country. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, South Africa may return to pre-COVID GDP levels in 2024, but perhaps not before. The pandemic amplified the macro fiscal challenges South Africa was already facing. Esetite phase two will therefore increase activities around fiscal policy questions and macroeconomic policy modeling the aim to deliver an evidence base on a range of topics in this area that will help inform policymakers on macroeconomic policy matters. This includes research and analysis on how South Africa, South Africa can devise macroeconomic policies that lead to sustainable growth but at the same time reduce inequality through fiscal redistribution. Univide is looking forward to working with the National Treasury and other stakeholders in South Africa for an exciting phase of policy relevant research in the next phase of SATIDE and to make a real big difference on policy in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kanal. Really appreciate the insight and information you've shared with us. And thank you to all our speakers who've joined us here today from Wibuso Mudise, the Minister of Finance, Minister Inoko Dongwana, as well as Kunal Sen, all for sharing their insight and detail into what promises to be very important research and insight that we will be looking to implement here in South Africa and enabling the decisions and, of course, outcomes that we look to attain through policy formation. We also want to thank you as our viewers for joining us for this discussion and, of course, keeping the conversation going with your questions and, of course, the feedback that you've received from our SA Tide representatives. A link to the SA Tide report is available in the live chat and will also be made available in communication that will follow after this online event. The link to the recorded discussion and further information on the BDTV rebroadcast of this discussion will be included in our thank you mailer, which will be sent after today's event. So be sure to keep an eye out for that. As we conclude, I'd like to send a special thank you to the SA Tide program and its partners. United Nations University, World Institute for Development Economics Research, UniWIDA, the National Treasury, and the International Food Policy Research Institute, along with the South African Revenue Service, Department of Trade, Industry, and Competition, the Department of Planning, Monitoring, and Evaluation, and Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies. To all of our counterparts and all of our stakeholders, a hearty thank you and, of course, ongoing support that we received from our partners at the EU, including the ongoing financial support and resources that are offered. To all of you for joining us once more, thank you so much for joining us, and we wish you a wonderful day further.